afternoon, everyone. Um, a slight update. When, the, uh, when I sent my profile over to, to the conference organizer, so we were Draper Esprit LLP. Since then, we have listed on the London Stock Exchange, so now we are Draper Esprit PLC. Quite excited about that. So um, I will start with my slides, if I could have them. Um, yeah. So uh, I was invited to speak about genomics. Um, and this is um, something which we, uh, most of us uh, are exposed to in, in regular press these days about how much progress we are making in genomics and, and how that is going to transform our, our health. And so I thought I'll put something together which is going to crystallize of where we are and where might we might go from here. So um, before I start, I, I want to kind of put the landscape as an investor of what, what um, digital health what we feel digital health is and what we do do every day. So this is, um, this is the, the principle. My, my investment philosophy starts from here, that um, we have a view on what the future of healthcare will, will look like and how it will be, be achieved, and we are on our way to trying to find the most exciting in, innovations and most, most exciting opportunities to invest into, and in, along the way, we meet things like big data, genomics, connectivity, artificial intelligence. But as, as um, I was discussing with someone around lunchtime is that we, we don't obsess about whether something has AI or try and put AI onto everything that we see. We actually first try and put it in context of what impact it might have on healthcare or, and on human life before we, we look at things. Um, so this is how, uh, it's a, a classic two-by-two two matrix that, that we follow, which is technological innovation and, and business model innovation on one axis and B2C and B2B um, business models on the other axis. And this is, um, so you will see here all the various different businesses we see and you, you hear about. And these are essentially um, the various applications of digital technology onto the healthcare industry and, and they, they, this is how, how it maps, maps up. I have a portfolio of about eight digital health companies, and this is how they map on there. So, so this is uh, Push Doctor, which is a, um, a medical consultation business, Horizon, which is a CRISPR genomics platform, Frameshift, which is a, um, a, a high-end um, uh, shift management uh, software, Fruidic Analytics, Mimi, which is a hearing aid product for, for people uh, which can work on an iPhone. Uh, Duo Fertility, which is, a, which is a, a wearable device for people who want to, want to get pregnant. Uh, My Recovery, which is uh, another one of pa patient management uh, platform. And then um, Omixi, which is a consumer genomics place. So this is how my portfolio maps onto what, what we see as, as the digital health uh, opportunity out there. Um, so one thing it would be good, good to start is uh, where exactly are we today? What, what, is, um, uh, what is the landscape? So let's start with the good news. Um, so we are somewhere on this chart. This, is, this shows life expectancy at birth. This is weighted average for the whole world, given that this is World Digital Health Congress. Um, and essentially, we live a lot longer than we used to live. And that's fantastic news. Um, if you look at survival after being diagnosed with cancer, you know, things are, things are looking up. But not everything is, is good news because death is still very common. It seems to happen quite regularly. It seems to happen to most people at least once. Um, and, and these are the common causes in the US of, of death. And so we have not really conquered death yet. And, and this is what, what happens. But we have done something interesting. But we know who the enemy is. We know these are the things we do every day which um, lead us to, to, to die. Um, so, you know, all the things we used to do for fun are on there. Um, so, so that's basically what it is. And, you know, at the end of this conference, we will go down to have some alcohol. But notice, alcohol actually improves your, your survival. There's the curve goes left. But that's only if you have two drinks. Because people rapidly slip from there to right to the other end where they have an injury and then they die. So that's what, what, what happens. So anyway, um, 
So this is, this is what, what, what progress we have made. We have, we have reduced mortality. We have reduced mortality from, from many causes. Most of the reasons we die off are, are somewhat within our control. So that brings us back to the question, so where exactly are we? So if you use a very generic uh, graph here, where on the vertical axis we have human progress. This could be anything. This could be speed at which cars uh, drive. Uh, infant mortality uh, reduction, it could be uh, longevity, it could be many other things. And on the horizontal axis is time. So the question that one, one you know, it's quite clear that it's kind of going up, right? This green line is pretty much okay. Um, so, but the question then is that, are we at A, are we at B, or are we at C? And if you were, if A was 1960 and B was 1990, that kind of makes sense. We've kind of progressed a little bit. If B was 19, 1970 and C is 1990, that would make sense too. But why is it so important to know where we are? And there's just one reason to know where we are, which is what if this is about to happen? What if it's something about uh, in human progress is about to go this way? And if you were this person who's standing here looking backwards because that's all you can do, you wouldn't know it was about to happen. So if you look around, there are a lot of technologies that are growing at exponential rates, and some of those technologies are having impact on things. For example, the speed of the computer that you have in your pocket just now is faster than the fastest computer that existed in 1980. That is quite a bit like that um, on a scale of human existence. So what is the other thing that, that so one of, the, one of the things I do is look for what other things could be doing this. And could I be the guy not looking that way, but looking this way? And genomics seems to be one of those things. It fits some of those criteria. So here's um, a chart which shows the, the black line is Moore's law. So Moore's law is responsible for giving you that fast computer you have in your pocket in such a short period of time at a price you can afford, not only you, three billion people in the world can afford it. So that is what, what is the underlying dynamic on which the whole of the technology industry is based. Now if you compare that to the price of sequencing a genome, you can see that since October 2006, genomics has been beating Moore's law. And most people haven't even heard about it. And this chart is almost certainly out of date because I, I'm pretty sure that the, that the cost of uh, sequencing a genome is going to be falling faster than what, what we see in this curve. What happened to the speed? So genomics is a second coming for me. I, when I was a junior doctor, um, my research was in genomics. I used to work for the Wellcome Trust, which was one of the investors in the Human Genome Project. And I was around when that happened. You see that from 1995 to about 1998, it kind of grows at a certain speed and then it slows down and then it kind of goes vertical. Um, that's what happened. There was one new technology which was um, a company called Selexa out of Cambridge in the UK. It developed a technology which, which increased the speed of genomic sequencing to that rate. And that company was acquired by Illumina which is now the world leader in, in uh, genomic sequencing. So if you look at, look at some of the dynamics of genomics, they do look very, very attractive in that form. So what happens when something, um, the speed goes up and price goes down? This is what happens. The number of genomes being sequenced is, again, a pretty vertical curve. So it's predicted that in, in 2025, you will have tens of billions of genomes being sequenced. So that's another interesting dynamic. So where did we come from? So when I started medical school, we, we used to do genetics. There was no genomics. Genetics was more like cottage industry, where you do one thing at a time. People used to find a gene for a disease, uh, and that would be their favorite gene. They would then do research on that gene for the rest of their, their careers, and they were like hunter-gatherers. Um, and then what we have done when we do genomics is we've kind of industrialized that process. And if you then look around what other industries have have gone through that, that whole transformation, you can see almost every other industry has gone through a cottage industry stage and then industrialization stage. And when industrialization happens, new applications get, get figured out and lots and lots of people get it. So maybe that's about to happen. Um, so to give you an idea of the gap between, um, 
between uh, cottage industry down to where we are today. Um, in 1999-2000, there was a big battle on between Solara Genomics, which was a company in California, and the Human Genome Project, which was a publicly funded project. And Craig Venter, who's a, who's a pioneer in that field, decided that he's going to completely change the dynamics. So he went and bought 261 ABI sequences. That was the most expensive sequencing machine you could buy. He, he didn't buy one or two or three. He bought 261 of those, put them in a lab, and started to sequence the genome. This is what we in the public program had been doing for about 10 years. And he decided to sequence the whole genome in nine months. And that was seen as a major, major achievement. Last time I heard Craig, he said he's now bought one machine, which is this one, which is the HiSeq X10 machine. He bought, he's bought two of these. And one of these machines does 40,000 genomes in a year. That gives you an idea of the scale of the vertical part of the curve that we are on. That's the speed at which we are doing it. So when you move from being a, a cottage industry geneticist to genomicist, this is, this is kind of what happens when there's an elephant and there are lots of blind people trying to figure out what it is, they all have a view because they have a very narrow tunnel vision, or no vision in this case, but they, they are able to see very small parts of it, so somebody think, thinks it's like a rope, somebody thinks it's like a snake, somebody thinks it's like a mat. But when you actually see the big picture, you realize it's none of those things. And that's what we are currently realizing when we start, start looking at the world in a, in a, on, on a bigger scale. So when, when, when I was training, a biologist would say, well, one gene m means one protein. A biochemist would say one gene, one enzyme. And a physician would say one gene, one disease. And you know, I'm sitting there saying, why are you not looking at the, at the big picture? And that's what has started to, to occur. And that, I think, is a fundamental shift in, in, in the way we think about it. But when, you know, it's, it's, you know, the simplified version of, of genomics is that we have, um, we have six billion base pairs and we read them from one end to the other. But that's just the beginning. Because it's not just reading. We have started writing the genome now. We have started to cut and paste like you do on your computer uh, on, on our DNA. And we can use the uh, technologies like CRISPR where we can, with high level of efficiency, cut a particular piece of DNA that we don't like and replace it with another piece of DNA that, that may be better for you. And this can be done um, relatively easily. It can be done at a very high speed. And then another thing which we can't forget is that it's not just us. We can be arrogant and think, think that we are just the, the guys who have a genome, but every living organism has, has a genome, and we've sequenced hundreds of these. This is the z genome of zebrafish. Um, I mean, the only reason, I don't think you care, but the only reason I, I put it there was to see the overlap. If you see the, see the overlaps of how much we have common with zebrafish, that kind of puts us in our place, doesn't it? So, um, so, that's, so that's basically the technology and what's happening and what's, what's happening in the background, why I'm excited about, about this being another t exponential technology that we may just be at the cusp of. So what, what, so what, right? Someone's going to say, yeah, I've seen a lot of, lot of slides. What, what does that actually mean? What are the real applications? There are a number of real applications which are currently available. These applications are, are things that we are not talking about, things that are, uh, you hear on TV and, and then they say, well, how far is it really? Oh, it's going to be 10, 20 years before this actually happens. So, so I'll, I'll walk you through some of the examples of where genomic technology is actually making a difference or has already made a difference. You may or may not have, have encountered that. I think the other thing which may, it, it puts in perspective is that it's not going to be a long time before we are all genetically modified. There are all these people who are worried about, you know, eating genetically modified food. And in some years from now, you'll probably be sitting there saying, actually, some of my best friends are genetically modified. <laughs> and that's probably going to happen. And it's, it's, it's about to, to, to happen in that way. So look at oncology. This is one of the areas where, where genomics is having, uh, having a very, very deep impact and very rapidly. And these are ways where we can edit people's DNA to find out to, to change, change the, uh, um, the constitution of, the, of their cells. We can stratify patients better. We can take a blood sample for them, from them and do what is called a liquid biopsy and sequence the DNA we find and we can find that the tumor which we thought had, dis has go had gone has come back. We can look at a particular sequence and find out that 
the drug we are about to give to a patient is not going to work because they have a different oncogene which is activated and that oncogene does not respond to this particular drug. This is already happening. There are pa patients around the world who are receiving treatment like that. This is um, another application of genomics which is in uh, prenatal diagnosis. So if you um, are about to have a child, you may want to know if the child may suffer from, from uh, a condition that, that may be relevant. And now you can do that from blood. You can take a blood sample of the mother, and look, this is not science fiction, this is really true. Through the placenta, the DNA of the, of the fetus crosses across, goes into the bloodstream of the mother where we can find it, and we can sequences, sequence it, and we can find out without any risk to the fetus what the DNA constitution of the, of the baby will be. Um, if you look at, at the bottom, this is a, uh, a collaboration um, started by uh, Duke University where they are sequencing 100, the genomes of 100,000 newborns. So when a child is born and the child ends up in, in an intensive care unit within the first five days of its life, the probability of that problem being genetic is extremely high because the child has not interacted with the environment in the same way. The child has not been smoking, has not been having fatty food, et cetera. So the probability of that condition being related to genetics is much larger, so now they're testing out to see if we can sequence the DNA and find out what, is, what might be the reason for that. Uh, precision medicine, this is, um, uh, this is another, um, uh, so one of the things we do we, when we classify diseases, we, did, we use um, whatever means we have available to distinguish one disease from another, so type one versus type two diabetes, but that is dependent on the, our ability of how much information we can get about the, about the patient. And so currently you see that's how diabetes is classified, and most people who have diabetes don't necessarily are, uh, won't know which one they have out there. But in the future, it will probably look more like this tree, and we'll, we'll be able to distinguish various patients with, with diabetes. They have slightly different versions of diabetes, and then we'll know which drugs work for, for which people in what way. On the left-hand side, you will see this, this paper, which is from actually not, it's actually only two weeks old. So this is just, just, it's from the 9th of June, where they took uh, patients who have acute myeloid leukemia and tried to sequence their genome to find out how many groups they, f they fell into, and they found that there were 11 different groups of people who have AML, and each group has a different way of, of, uh, of, of managing it. So this is quite, quite useful. If you have AML, you don't want to be treated like every other person and have, have some kind of mediocre outcome when you could find out which group you're in and then have treatment for which is right for that group. Uh, infectious diseases, so it's not just, just the extreme end of, end of that. If you think of infectious diseases, we are making huge progress using, using genomics. Right on the top is something which has had an impact on, on, on people's health for almost 20 years. This is a test for RNA of hepatitis C virus. If you have this RNA, that means you have an infection. And for a lo long time, we've been able to test people uh, for their RNA levels and find out if the drug they are on is working or not working, which has accelerated the whole field of hepatitis C research because you can very quickly in a matter of weeks know whether a drug works or doesn't work. And as a result, we have a lot of new drugs in hepatitis C, as you may have read in, in popular press. Uh, this is a company which is trying to um, trying to sequence the genome of bugs which may be drug resistant. So what happens currently is the way you find out that someone's resistant to a particular drug is you give them the drug and they don't get, get better. And that's already quite a big, big problem. So this company, uh, which is called 1928 uh, Diagnostics, based in Copenhagen, they can sequence the DNA. Uh, and on, on the top left, I don't know if you can see it very clearly on the slide, this is a software called Microbe. It takes the data that comes out of a DNA sequencer and is able to identify if the bug which is in the sample is, is resistant to a particular drug. Um, microbiome, I'm sure you've been reading about this. This is, um, you know, we already, always knew that bugs are bad for us, but it turns out that more bugs are good for us than, 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 than bad. So we can now identify what bugs live inside and around us and how they, they interact with us and how they make us healthy. And it has impact um, much wider than what you would have imagined. Um, 
and personalized medicine. This is, this is a new paradigm. It's slightly different from precision medicine. Uh, this is a paradigm, so on the top right you see, see the paradigm in which, which is already happening, where you, you, have, um, you identify a particular antigen that is expressed on your tumor, and then you take lymphocytes from the patient, and then, you know, you won't believe this, you actually edit the DNA of these lymphocytes to make sure that they respond, respond to this antigen, and then you inject these lymphocytes back into, into the patient, and these lymphocytes with this new training they have received go and attack the tumor. And this drug is for only this person. This drug is particularly made for the person because everybody has a different antigen uh, repertoire on their, on their tumors. This is a company which um, on the left-hand side is a company which is in our portfolio called Chiodis in the Netherlands. What uh, they do is that they're able to identify lymphocytes which are white blood cells which, are, which will attack a, um, a transplant you have just received, and they take those cells out and put the rest of your cells back so you have a really good immune system, but you don't have those specific cells which would have gone and damaged the, the new uh, organ you have just received. So these are some real examples. These are happening today. These are not things which are in the future, 100 years from now. These are things which, which are happening today. So this is what, what I find is, is really, really exciting about uh, the world of genomics. Um, thank you very much.